Welcome to the human resource. Today's topic is going to be probably a question that if you're a human resource representative, you have asked a million times. We're going to talk about PTO, paid time off, and vacation. It's, it's probably one of the most common questions I get as a consultant is, should we be offering PTO, pay time off, or you know, what, what are the advantages to offering PTO versus vacation? And you know what, to be very truthful, it depends on who you are, it depends on who you are as a company, and it depends on, on the people that you are actually employing. So what I thought I'd do is we'd go over 10 different questions that I ask my clients when they're asking or reviewing the, the whole concept of PTO versus vacation. So if you've, if you've thought about it, or maybe, you, maybe you're already offering PTO, let me give you a couple things to think about. Because um, maybe out of these 10, there's something in here that you can add into your own. But the very, very first is if you're going to offer vacation or PTO, why are you doing it? Are you doing it so that they have something immediately at the beginning of the year? Are you doing it so that they have something to recognize their anniversary date? But the question really is, when are they going to earn it? Or when does it start to accrue? Now, let's, let's take those two definitions to begin with. When somebody earns something, that means that it's a part of their compensation plan you, you negotiate at the beginning, at the, at the time of hire, and say, oh, when you take this position, you're automatically going to have three weeks vacation. So whether it's on the anniversary date or the calendar date of January 1, that individual knows that they're going to have another three weeks coming. They've earned it. If it's a cruel, they're going to have to earn it as the time is worked. So every pay period, they're going to get a portion of that three weeks. Now, a lot of people don't quite understand that because they think it's really difficult to calculate. It's, it's hard to track. But very truthfully, I would say that the majority of you are using a payroll system that can calculate that for you. So every time somebody works a week, they actually have accrued a little bit more towards their PTO. So they can actually see that as a portion of their payroll and on their payroll records. So question one is, is it something that they should earn or is it something they have to accrue? Now, if you're earning it now, if you're giving them lump sums now, remember, if they earn another three weeks starting January 1, that means that if they walk in on January 2, you've got to pay out. If they terminate, they resign on January 2nd, you have to pay out that three weeks of vacation, which they earned on January 1. If it's accrued, and here's the catch, if it's accrued, if they haven't accrued any PTO of that three weeks, there's nothing to pay out. There's nothing to pay out. So you make them earn, accrue their PTO or vacation the more they work. So that tends to be an advantage when you're comparing vacation and accrual. Question number two, are you going to allow them to roll it over every year or is it a use it or lose it policy? And as you're thinking this through, if this is a question that you and your company are, are considering. Remember, you don't have to, they don't have to lose it all at the same time. In fact, I have to remind those of us uh, that are, are, or those of you who are listening to the podcast in other states, some of your states don't allow you to take that PTO away. California in particular they get to keep it forever. If they don't use it, it just rolls into the next year. It just keeps rolling until their time of separation. Other states say, no, 
they they get to keep it, but they only get to keep it for a period of time, or they only get to keep a portion of it. It depends on where you're at. So how does your company want to approach it? Use it or lose it. Number three, if they're going to lose it, would you give them the option to pay it out? Can they get a lump sum for that PTO or vacation? If you're going to make those kind of decisions, you need to get with your CFO, your controller, and talk about what kind of a budget you need to have if you're starting to get through into third quarter and realize that three-fourths of the PTO or vacation hasn't been used, and you may have to write checks on December 31st. It's a consideration. Some companies, they'll pay out a, a portion. They'll pay out any vacation or, or uh, PTO that was denied based on the needs of the business. So someone wanted to take a, their third week of vacation in November, and all of a sudden the company realized, no, we, we, can't you, we can't give you that time off. We need you here to work, so we'll go ahead and pay you that time period out. Something to think about. Number four, are we going to require that they use paid time before unpaid time? Think about that. If someone comes and asks you for time off and they have a week of vacation or a week of PTO and they're eligible for it, are you going to allow them to take time unpaid knowing that this vacation time is still out there and that at some time throughout the year, they're going to want to take additional time off and get paid for it. Some of you can afford to do that. And a lot of you can't. So think about that. You can easily tell people, well, you know what? If you want to take time off, that's fine. I don't don't care what it's for or why, but if you're going to take time off, I need you to use your paid time first. This is a really good way of pulling back and helping employees think about the the use of their PTO or, or the need to take time off. If they realize it's unpaid or that they have to use their paid first, there's a really good chance that they won't use it or they'll use more of it if it's unpaid because they know that they still have this paid time out out there. And if it's a use it or lose it, there's a good chance they're going to force you to try to make them use it. So ask yourself, are we using this? Are you using that as a part of your policy? And if not, why? Why aren't you? I love it. I add it to all all the policies I write. Then what about productive and non-productive time? Standard practice for most of us is the understanding that Any PTO or vacation time is non-productive. And I say non-productive because that that alludes to and really truly means it's not used to calculate overtime. So if somebody has a work week and they took Monday off as the vacation, but between Tuesday and Friday they work over 40 hours, or let's say, let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they worked 10 hour days. So they have 40 hours productive, eight hours from the vacation on Monday. That's 48 hours. They would get a, a straight pay of 48 hours. I've got one client that will pay that eight hours on Friday as overtime. They'll allow that vacation and PTO time to be productive time. How are you calculating it? And what fits within your culture? That's going above and beyond the Fair Labor Standard Act. You don't have to. There's no federal or state law that says you have to pay vacation or PTO as a portion of overtime. But you might want to think about it if it would work with your culture and your business. Then what about, and this is a clause that I always add in on my own, and it came up the other day with a client who has not let me look at their or review their their uh, handbook yet, but we were talking a little bit about their PTO and vacation policies, and she said something about, well, that's all we need is for them to take, you know, give us their resignation on January 2nd, 
And then they'll end up using those two weeks of vacation in lieu of their two-week notice. Well, guys, I always put that in as policy. Vacation or PTO cannot be used in lieu of a two-week notice at the time of resignation. How would that fit within your policy? Would that help you accomplish the goals that you're trying to achieve? And would it send the right message to your team? How about any blackout periods? You know, with some of my manufacturing firms, they absolutely have, they have to have blackout periods. They have to have blackout periods when the, when the machinery is down and they need to have the entire plant maintenanced. That's time when the individuals know there's going to be no work available. So you need to either save your PTO and vacation for that time or know that there won't be any work for you. There's a reverse to that as well. There are times when an organization will say, Oop, we can't approve any vacation, especially around the holidays. If you're a retailer, you cannot afford to approve big chunks of vacation or PTO during the busiest season of the year. How does your company work with that? And have you even thought about having a blackout period? Then the easiest one to think about, number uh, eight or nine, I think I've lost track. (laughs) But the easiest one to think about is what increments can somebody take a vacation or pay time off in? You know, with your payroll systems, again, they can calculate increments even at a half hour if you want to approve that. But most commonly people think about, well, it's just eight hours, right? It's just a full day. But maybe not. If somebody takes a a doctor's appointment or somebody wants to go see their child's uh, performance and they need to use PTO or vacation, many of your payroll systems will allow you to calculate in two, four, six, eight-hour increments. It's simple. It'll help them stretch out their PTO and vacation, but also make sure that it's an accurate calculation. Think about it or talk to your payroll system. You might have more flexibility there than you think. And then here's the other one. I guess we're on number nine. How do you want them to request PTO or vacation? I see so many handbooks that say, well, you have to request it and get it approved prior to taking it. But what did that actually say? How are they supposed to request it? Is it supposed to be in writing? Are you actually going to take a verbal request? How can you back that up? Especially if you deny a verbal, how can you prove that you denied a verbal? And do you want it just spontaneous? Some companies require a two-week notice. Well, that's not practical if they need to take a PTO or a vacation day because their child's sick or because there's an emergency in the family. And in writing is so vague. Let's, Let's think about that one for a minute. In writing, is that a text message? Is that an email? Is that a a proper form, official form that the company has? What does that mean? And, And at this point, I would say, all these suggestions that I've just made, go back to your PTO and your vacation policy. What are you asking your employees to do? And On your side, what are you offering your employees to do? Pay time off, vacation, there isn't much of a difference. Remember, the best part as an employer to remember is that you don't want to babysit. Don't babysit. Don't ask a lot of questions. If they want to exhaust the time, let them exhaust the time. It's a benefit. But we can take that conversation even further on a future version of the human resource. My name is Pandy. And I want to say a shout out to Vicki who called me this morning who says, I listen to the podcast while I'm cleaning. Well, Vicki, I don't care when any of you listen to the podcast or watch the podcast. I'm just thrilled you are. So thank you to the Vickies in the world. Oh, and by the way, any of you who send in a question or give me a topic to speak on, 
I will be sending you one of our two favorite books, uh, HR on Purpose by um, Steve Brown. He's been on the show. There's a podcast with him and Living the Five Skills of Tolerance by Scott Warwick. You know, this is one of my favorite mentors. Scott is fabulous. Send us in your suggestion, send us in your question, and I will send you a book. Thanks again for watching and listening. We'll catch you again.